So in chapter 12 is about output stages. So still, remember I told you that the first part of the course was about things that you could use if you're doing board level type design. Then in the second part is about the integrated circuit specifically, uh, how to, to make op amps in, in, in a chip, in a, in a VLSI design, with a VLSI design approach. Um, and the op amp, of course, is the workhorse of all uh, non-digital design. Uh, so it's very important. So we devote the second half of the course to that, but um, we're still on the on the board level uh, type of material. And this is about output stages, uh, also known as power amplifiers. And since we normally are working with constant voltage uh, levels, and when we are going to drive a load, and we talk about power amplification, we are talking about the delivery of different amounts of current. So these are loads that will change and what they demand differently is the amount of current, but you may drive it at the same voltage uh, because you have a constant, sort of a, a voltage uh, type uh, output. So when we talk about power amplification, we're talking about really current amplification. There is also a classification of the different types of output stages, given their uh, level of nonlinearity and efficiency. And normally things that are, the more nonlinear they are, the more efficient they are. So I wanted to share with you uh, a couple of uh, pictures in the book. So let's just go to um, let's just go to figure one. And and figure one <clears throat> refers to uh, the classification of output uh, stages. And the other thing that I want to say that because 99% of designs uh, are done with CMOS, I focus on CMOS uh, technology, but output drivers is uh, still <clears throat> one area where you will see a lot of usage of uh, BJTs or bipolar transistors. And that's because from a current amplification perspective, the, the BJT is a current controlled uh, type of amplifier. So the model, the small signal model is a current control current source versus the MOSFET that is a voltage control current source. So the BJT offers a lot better current amplification than MOSFETs. Uh, so they are used and technology, but you will do a lot with, with CMOS on the same technology and that type of technology is called by CMOS for bipolar and CMOS. Uh, but um, there is a, a dichotomy to the classification of output stages. And here they talk about the collector current. So we're talking about BATs, we're talking about the output uh, current of the transistor. And we have uh, four, classifications here. And they're just simply classified by, by a letter. So class A is your linear type of amplifier. So where you would see the collector current uh, or the collector uh, or the transistor conducting all the time. So this is a linear type of amplification. Then you have uh, class B where the transistor conducts only half the time. So that, that is shown in, the, um, in figure 12.1B. Then there is a um, class AB, um, class AB classification where the transistor conducts, um, the transistor is off a little bit less than half the time, okay? 
And then the class C is when the transistor is off more than half the time, okay? Then we also later on are going to talk about class D, which is widely used. And that, that's probably the, the, the type of output stage driver that is used uh, the most today. So like your cell phone is chock full of this uh, type of output stage to drive the speaker and, and so on. So that's class D, very efficient. Um, and that's really uh, fully nonlinear type of uh, digital driver into the amplifier and then using PWM to uh, and some filtering to, to develop the, the output to the load. So these are the classifications of the output stages. And here's the, the class, the class D, okay? So with the PWM as an input and the actual, what you actually develop uh, as an output to the load is encoded by the PWM uh, waveform. So this is called class D. So, so in the book, they talk about um, BATs and that's still valid, but we can also have uh, CMOS output uh, stages. So let's, uh, let's go to figure 1220 and take a look at a source follower and um, look at it in, in, in from a class A perspective. So a, a linear type of uh, output stages with CMOS transistors can be a source, a source follower and is basically the equivalent of an emitter follower with BJTs. And uh, that's where you put the input into the gate and then you take the output uh, of the source. And if, if you recall, or maybe, maybe not, but um, so this is, a, this is a type of amplifier that will give you a, uh, a current type of amplification uh, given uh, an input. So we have, um, we have RL as the, the load. We also have a biasing of the transistor with the current mirror. So um, Q, Q3 and Q2 form a current mirror that is mirroring the current from an active load I. And we will go into um, current mirrors uh, in the second half of the course because they are a basic building block to, to bias transistors, which is needed for building op amps. So if we look at, um, so let me stop sharing. If we look at um, that, that figure, uh, the, the question is, and what is important for output stages is what is the range of the output that you can get um, as you try to drive the load at higher current. So in a sense, we would say, what is VO max? And what is VO min? And let's say that we're posing that question for um, the source follower and I'm going to simplify the current mirror and say that that source follower has a VI and some bias current I, and that is provided by the current mirror that you saw in the figure. I'm not drawing that. Uh, and then we have RL here. Because what's important is what is the maximum and minimum voltages that you can get for this uh, current amplifier. 
So that is going to be when uh, Q1 is in saturation. So this is Q1. And we can say that that is V D minus so that's the saturation voltage. Um, so when this Q1 is in saturation, that gives you the maximum voltage that you're going to see across RL. Okay. Now, the other question is, when do we see the minimum voltage? And uh, that is going to be when the transistor, so maybe what I should do at least is um, draw, instead of the current source, draw the transistor that sets that up. So it's going to be And this comes from the, this is part of the camera mirror. But when Q2 is in saturation, that's when you're going to see the minimum voltage across RL. So this means Q1 in saturation. And that voltage is going to be there should be only one of this here so hopefully you can you can see that when when the voltage here is the smallest, that's when you see the maximum value here. When the voltage across here is the smallest, that's when you are going to see the minimum value at this node. And when, when this is, when Q1 is at the smallest, but when this voltage is at the smallest over here, this is going to be something higher because you always have a constant between ground and VDD. And when this one is the smallest, this is going to be something higher because again, you have a constant voltage. So that's just um, a loop equation, a voltage loop equation across uh, around that loop. So the important consideration in designing, let's say this output stage is that the bias current I, so just that's the bias current I over here. Um, this uh, this has to be sufficient. to source all of the load but for what condition so the the condition is that i the bias current has to be greater than minus V ohm in divided by RL. And uh, just to clean that up, uh, let's see. Let's not do that.
So what I, what I mean by that is that I has to be greater or equal than VSS minus VO divided by RL. So that gives us a, um, a boundary on what that current must be. And why is that important? Because that helps us choose Q2. We have to choose a Q2 that can actually uh, pass that current. Or if we were doing this design in a VLSI approach, that would tell us what is the actual geometry of, of Q2. Uh, furthermore, if I can erase that drawing or not. Uh, yeah. So furthermore, um, the output uh, is going to be the input minus VGS one, which is going to be the input minus the voltage for M one, that's transistor uh, one minus V out for transistor one. The question we're going through this is because being that this is a um, a power output, how do we ensure that uh, we don't introduce distortion, that we don't distort what we're delivering to the load? Uh, because what happens is that these transistors are nonlinear devices and they their characteristics can change. If you are delivering a lot of load, they can be uh, temperature variations uh, because the currents can be large. So non uh, non constant and nonlinear So these quantities that are, are uh, dependent or that are properties of the transistor can cause uh, distortion. Over the range that we care about. So uh, the, over the range which really are the input uh, and output voltages. So that is related to the output uh, resistance of, of the amplifier. And the idea is that in this very specific stage, which is a very common uh, stage, uh, for, for output, for current amplification in CMOS, a, a source follower, how do we reduce the dependence on the output resistance of the transistor? Well, we can introduce um, negative feedback to reduce that output resistance and keep the input-output relationship so and keep uh, v i about the same as v o. Remember that we're not doing any voltage amplification. We want v out to be the same as v in. What we want is for q one and q two to be able to source the current as R L changes. But the voltage we want to be we want it to be the same ideally. 
Okay. So um, just to um, to take a look at what I'm talking about, let me go back to the uh, to the figures. So what we had was this, and we see that there may be issues of the introduction of distortion. Uh, and a big part of that is the RO of the transistors, Q1 and Q2. So how can we reduce the effect of that? And one way to do that is to introduce this negative feedback amplifier over here to mitigate that. That's what we're talking about. So that would be an enhancement to this circuit over here. So let's look at how the, um, the effect of RO gets, um, gets mitigated. And remember when we're talking about amplifiers, the main quantities that we want to find out are uh, things like what is the gain, what is the input resistance, what is the output resistance. In this case, we want to um, want to take a look at the output resistance. And from that perspective, what we're going to be looking at is at um, this type of analysis over here, okay? To determine the output resistance at that node, we're going to be um, looking at that at that output uh, with uh, with the output uh, transistor. So let's go back to so keep in mind this uh, this figure. Uh, keep in mind this figure. So for that figure twelve twenty two. Let's just do a feedback analysis and see uh, what effects uh, that negative uh, feedback amplifier has on the output assistance of the overall system. So we start with simply stating that the gain, closed loop gain is going to be VO over VI. And for that topology, that's going to be the transconductance um, of the amplifier. And remember this was a P type uh, amplifier times the output resistance of that transistor was a P type uh, transistor rather in parallel with RL. So that's a, a small signal uh, articulation of that. So we can see that by inspection of this expression, that the output resistance is going to be RL times the output resistance of the P transistor. And would you recall that that this was um, the open loop? This was for the first case. Okay, this was for the first case in that. In, in the figure, the one that was on, on, the, uh, on the left. So this is um, without amplifier. <clears throat> now let's introduce feedback and call that output resistance, the output resistance with feedback. And remember that we could reduce the output resistance by the introduction of feedback. So this is back from uh, chapter 11. And the output resistance would be reduced what by the amount of feedback. So without the amplifier, we had no feedback. So this is this becomes now the open loop gain uh, for the feedback case.
So this was the amount of feedback for the feedback case. So output resistance with feedback. That is the original output resistance. So that's reduced by the amount of feedback. Notice that in this case, we just introduce a, a voltage follower type of negative uh, feedback or just a, an amplifier with a gain of, uh, of one. So beta is one, okay? And for the introduction of the amplifier, what is important to keep in mind is, well, beyond the fact that beta is one, is that these quantities, are properties of the transistor and they change. They're not a static. They change depending on the biasing of the transistor. So it's important to remember that the output resistance of the transistor and the transconductance of the transistor are, uh, are evaluated at the bias point. Of that transistor. So we have, we had a, um, we had an expression for ROF. So the output resistance with feedback. And then if we wanted to calculate, if we wanted to calculate what is the auto of the transistor with the feedback, this is for the whole system, but what is it for just a transistor? How much were we able to uh, reduce the effect of auto then what we have to do is exclude RL from ROF. So um, for to do this, we exclude exclude RL from ROF. And therefore, if you do that, then because they are in parallel. You excluded with this expression because RL is in parallel with add out P with the feedback. And if you crank this out, um, you get that the reduce R out of the transistor in parallel with uh, now usually um, usually this expression, I mean, the, the transistor is designed to conduct. So this expression here is 
much lower. I'm talking about this. So you have to think about this as a resistor. This is a resistance, one over the transconductance. Uh, this is the, um, a much lower resistance because the transistor is made to conduct, to be a good conductor uh, when activated. Therefore, since this is much lower than ROP, then the output uh, resistance just uh, can be approx approximated by one over mu times the transconductance. Remember that mu is the mobility, is the mobility of the charge, uh, majority charge carrier. If we're talking about uh, a P transistor, then mu is mu sub P, which is the uh, mobility of holes, okay? Um, and then G is the, uh, the transconductance. So, uh, which is, is great because if you, are going to be delivering current, um, you know, that that's, uh, you, want a sm you want that type of a small output, um, output resistance. Or, I'm sorry, if you're going to be del delivering current on the constant voltage. So let's look back at, um, figure 23 now. Let's look at a class AB case. So a push pull, push pull um, configuration. So now instead of having a bias for QP, what we have is a QP that is going to be in charge of um, sourcing current uh, into the load and a QN that is going to be in charge of uh, sinking current from the load, okay? So that way we have, uh, this, give, this gives you a, a better, uh, better symmetry in, in the output. But the same approach of the negative feedback uh, amplifier is um, has been applied to both. Okay, so that would be a a class A B common source uh, again using uh, using feedback and um, so let's let's go through. Um, Let's go through the analysis of this topology. So for for this for this uh, topology, I can extend the the value of um, of the output resistance. So this is figure twelve twenty three, and these are the specific topologies. So these are not just examples. These are the specific topologies that are used. So we have source follower with active um, uh, biasing, current mirror biasing. We have uh, this push pull with um, uh, uh, feedback uh, from the output to the gates uh, of the transistor. So these are the specific topologies that are used, uh, commonly used. And uh, for that topology, the add out or the, uh, after you go through the same thing that we just went, the output um, resistance can be approximated by So now we have an N transistor. And usually these transistors are match. So usually, And what that means
is that R prime P? Uh, K prime. Oh, K prime. So basically that's just to show because I mean, essentially this is the, the transconductance, okay? But this is to show that you match the transistor because this, this, is, um, this is a function of the mobility. And the mobility is different for holes. So holes here and electrons here. So, but you have an end transistor here um, and you have a P transistor here, but you need to match. Uh, and usually what that means is that, you know that the mobility of electrons is greater than the mobility of holes. So you would have to make the uh, P transistor larger to compensate. So making the, the channel making the channel wider. So if, because they have to match. So what that means is that if you were going to design this in, let's say in a VLSI chip, your, um, your the, the width uh, of the channel for the P transistor would be larger than that of the, uh, end transistor by the same amount that the uh, mobility of uh, electrons is larger than the mobility of holes. And it's just, there is nothing you can do about, and nothing you can do uh, about the mobility. That's just a property of the semiconductor material. Uh, and then <clears throat> that, that is that relationship between the P and the N Absolute, in absolute, uh, in absolute, how large both transistors are, of course, depends on how much current you're trying to deliver to the load. Okay. Uh, and that would ensure then that there is uh, this two transistors have the same over voltage. Uh, at, at, the, at the bias point. So, and we're just going to, so a lot of this has to do with perhaps, uh, I don't know, chapter two perhaps uh, from electronics one on uh, MOSFET transistors. So you may want to go back and, and review uh, and review that because I can write the the output voltage based on the output currents for the transistors uh, in terms of of the the input which is related um, to the gate voltages of the transistor. So we can start writing this relationship with just MOSFET uh, voltage current relationships. And um, so for, for an input voltage, the current, the drain current for the P transistor is essentially the Core voltage minus mu over V out minus VI. So that's this is this um, a square law of the of the MOSFET, which um, can be written as
And uh, this um, here is your bias current, okay? So that gives you the drain current for the P. And if you do the same uh, thing for the N, then you get that. Uh, there is a negative sign. Um, there is a, a, um, a positive sign for the for the end channel. Here's the over, overdrive voltage. So that gives you the, the current for the push pull uh, at the output uh, for the load actually. So at the, at the output node, um, the actual current that the load is going to um, is going to see or is going to receive so the output current is going to be the current um, source by the P uh, and the current uh, sunk by the end channel. And IL is V out over RL. So uh, your output voltage if we use the IDP and IDNs that we had before, becomes so notice that we're talking about current amplification. So V out is going to be degraded sum from V in. Um, and that's, um, that's the, the effect of the transistor uh, and the biasing and the load as well. I mean, so basically here, the greater the load, uh, the weaker the biasing, uh, the more degradation you're going to get on V out from uh, from V in, and uh, since the trans uh, transconductances are the same, because we match the transistors. Uh, at the bias point, that's going to be then at out, the output resistance becomes again. This is a property of the. This is a parameter of the transistor. That's the overdrive voltage. For the transistors and which should be the same because they're match this is mobility and this is the uh the bias current and um if you recognize this expression uh in the 
the overall gain, then you have that the, the gain of that current amplifier, the voltage gain of that current amplifier, which ideally you would like it to be one, is um, given by this expression. So um, this clearly says the lower add out is, the closer this is going to be to one, which is what you want. And the lower add L is, the closer this is going to be, um, or, the, um, or the higher actually, the closest is going to be to one. Um, so that that that's the analysis for that uh, class A B um, amplifier. Um, let's see. Wait, uh, Dr. Hernandez. Yes. So, uh, since we're looking for like current driven sources, why are we still dealing with, why are we still de uh, dealing with MOSFETs instead of BJTs? Well, because they're still used. Uh, I, as I said at the beginning, I just wanted to um, to mention the this the usage of BJTs. That doesn't mean that the MOSFETs are not used. Uh, they're they're also used, but BJTs. I, I think that what I try to say is that my position for the course is that I only cover MOSFETs because that's mostly the design. But I wanted to highlight the exception that for output stages, BJTs are used as much as MOSFETs, but I'm still focusing on MOSFETs. Did, did that answer your question? Yeah, that did, thank you. That does, yeah, it doesn't mean that MOSFETs are used, it's just that uh, MOSFETs don't have an advantage over BJTs as they do with uh, other types of designs. In fact, BJTs are better, but, uh, it doesn't still overwhelm, uh, overwhelmingly uh, overcome the low cost nature and the ease of fabrication of MOSFETs. So I would say they're both used, um, but I'm, I'm just focusing on the MOSFET. Uh, this couple of topologies, the source follower and the class AB push pull with, uh, with feedback. Okay. So this is a this is a short um, this is a short uh, chapter. Which I um, I just wanted to wrap it up with. Um, Just showing some things, some figures in the book. So just showing the, the class D amplification, essentially uh, it's really just a encoding of the, the signal that you want to, um, to deliver into a PWM waveform. So if you, got, if you have um, an analog voltage, If you have an analog voltage, okay, and through a comparator, you combine it with a triangular waveform, essentially um, you're going to get a PWM out. So this is going in here, this is going into a comparator, and here you get a PWM, okay? And that PWM essentially is just um, driving a pure push-pull on-off 
uh, totem pole type of um, topology. So when when QP is off, QN is on, and when QP is on, QN is off. So you get that same, uh, oh, there is inversion. I mean, this is really an inverter. So there is inversion. So this, we can call this PWM not, and this one PWM. And then you low pass this and you can recover the analog that is encoded in the PWM form. Okay, so this is a low pass filter with an inductor and a capacitor, and that can drive um, a load. Now, the neat thing is, is that you really can get rid of this because you can come up with a speaker that actually the nature of the speaker does the low pass filtering for you. So you don't have to actually um, remember that speakers are inductive so and this is a current so the inductor in the speaker would give you the um the low pass for the current that you are delivering so what you have here is a pwm voltage but what you see is an analog current that is equivalent to that analog voltage um so when you get rid of this uh, low pass filter and the speaker does it for you. So it's pretty straightforward, but it's a, you know, one of those uh, neat tricks that uh, you want to know about. This is another, uh, H bridge type of uh, configuration of class D. So you can actually deliver um, and drive with uh, an H bridge configuration. So again, inductors and capacitor uh, to um, do the low pass filtering, but again, you can, you can get speakers that do it for you and you don't need any external uh, low pass filtering. Another uh, important consideration for power amplifiers and, uh, uh, and power transistors is the issue of uh, packages, heat sinks, and, uh, and heating in general, because power is, we're talking about high power. So, um, there are power BATs, so you have to take into consideration um, the size of the transistor and also how the transistor um, dissipates heat uh, and how the, you may have to use uh, heat sinks to remove heat from the transistor because uh, you can damage the transistor if you don't do that. If the heat essentially uh, doesn't get removed, you'll, you'll end up damaging the material so that that's another consideration for uh, power stages you can read more about that um, in the book and um, so no normally um, you know these circuits uh, are simple in nature I mean, really what you're looking for is to drive, uh, the topologies are simple. They, they can be large because you're driving large loads and you have to take into consideration heat and things like that. So um, power MOSFETs are being used uh, more and more. Um, again, they don't require the, um, uh, Complex driving, but uh, large MOSFETs also um, also have also have uh, large gate capacitances. So you may have to use a pre-driver just to drive a large power MOSFET because the the gate capacitance can be can be large. Um, so taking into account, uh, they can be fast. Um, you you should uh, <clears throat> uh, take into consideration this is for a BAT, but uh, 
you should, whoops. Um, you should take into uh, consideration uh, what is called the SOA or safe operating region of power transistors. That's, uh, that's important. This is, um, this is for a BAT, but uh, MOSFETs also have uh, very nice and ample uh, safe operating regions. When you look at the, uh, the in, the, in the case of the MOSFET would be the drain to source voltage uh, or the current, the, the, the drain current versus the, the voltage across the drain and, uh, and the source. So they have good um, operating regions uh, of safety. And these big transistors also, you may find in the literature that they refer to um, a different type of construction like um, double diffuse or DMOS uh, transistors instead of just uh, CMOS. So double diffuse, it only refers to the fact that you can have uh, a, a common, this is kind of like a, a cross section of the construction of the transistor. And you can have a common source region here, okay? And um, um, then this would be enhancement type. Uh, and here you have a region for drain source and here you have another drain region and this can be in a well this can be in a well and this would be another drain and this could this would be gate this would be a gate So, <clears throat> so what that allows you to do is spread the, uh, the current consumption uh, over an area. Uh, so the area would be, you know, this, if this was a 3D drawing, this would be the actual uh, width of the, uh, of the channel, which gives the transistor the, the strength would be in this direction here. You have gay material here. And so on. Okay. But basically, uh, once you form the channel, then you would uh, conduct both ways towards those two drains and sort of uh, mitigate the lo localization of the current. So that would be a construction of a double diffuse uh, or DMOS uh, power MOSFET. So they're as easy as, as building than, than the regular ones where you have uh, just a single, you have a source, gate, and drain. So, so the small transistors are like this, but power MOSFETs, may, they may use a double diffuse uh, construction. It would be called demos. That's about it. Um, I that's all I'm going to cover in, in chapter twelve.